Well, but I mean, you you worked more with the collection than anyone else. Yeah, about 30 years. Yeah, yeah. And there is no one who has your understanding of how it got started. So I actually think, I know it's not sequential, but if there's any way, how did you find out that the wall was being built? And tell me, I know you spent a lot of time down there before it was built, kind of uh, you, you and your post, uh, I think it's your VVA post would be there in the evenings, maybe. Um, can you talk a little bit to that? All right, the uh, chapter was chapter 43, which was the DC chapter before they merged with the uh, Merlin chapter. Um, what was going on is, okay, um, we're back in the 1980s and there's this rumor going about that the government is going to do something for the veterans. And you have to understand the uh, sarcasm and everyone's thinking, you know, this is, yeah, our government's going to do something for us. Okay, now we have to understand we're coming out the Vietnam War. Uh, people are still, well, you have the aftermath of the, uh, of, of the uh, decisions made in Vietnam. There are, it, it was just a different reality. And I always tell people this, you have to understand the zeitgeist of that time. It was completely different from today. Uh, whereas you have this welcome home, thank you for your service. That was absent during that time, okay. So anyway, um, I'm, looking at the newspaper and I see this article about the National Park Service retrieving these objects that are being left at the wall. Now, the, let me go back. I'm a native Washingtonian, so I'm here up close and in person. I'm down in the trenches. So I have a friend, his name is Lawrence Ballard. He was with the Marine Corps, childhood friend, before he, well, he passed away, but anyway, so we decided to go down to the National Mall and see what the government had in store for us. So we tramped on down there. I know it was in the evening. So we were asking people all about, I have this computer on. I didn't know which way we were going with this. Anyway, we were asking people directions to this memorial or whatever. And then the memorial had not been built. It was... Um, uh something that was going to happen so eventually after being misdirected we were directed to the site of the memorial so it was kind of odd but we looked at each other and said uh are you cleaning this up <laughs> Are you going to clean this up? Absolutely, Dury. Don't do not worry. Like you talk, share whatever you want to share. Oh, you mean with your language? Uh, you know, it depends, Dury. Probably, I will allow some swearing. Uh, okay. Verbatim, what was said. Larry and I looked at at each other, and it's like, I feel like a Vietnam veteran. Fucked again because no, they kept misdirecting us as to where this site was going to be. Now, understand when we get to the site, there's no memorial, it's just the site. This is going to be the site for all of this. So we noticed that, and I always tell people that people were leaving things at the site before the wall was even built, dedicated, which was very odd. Okay, you have yeah. this concept, you have this idea that there's going to be a, a memorial here at this site. People were leaving things at this concept and this anticipation. I tell people it's very important to understand that. So that was going on. So that you have this period where I don't know what happened to those objects that were being left. Do you remember okay. not specific? It even not specifically, but do you remember like the type of things that people were leaving? No, not really, because we're going back. No one foresaw it becoming what it became. So it's just like people just leaving things, unsolicited objects at this site. And again, the, it was the idea that there was no physical memorial 
but people were leaving things at this memorial. All right. So uh via so the um uh, uh, chapter 43. Uh I have to give my mother a lot of credit because she was she was hosting the chapter 43 at her house. And we used to sit around and and discuss where we were, uh where the veterans were you talk 1980s. So I'm reading this article in, in the, one of the newspapers. And back then in Washington, DC, you had, I don't know how many newspapers, but it, it was a bunch of newspapers. Again, it was a different time. So I came across this article about the National Park Service restoring these objects. They were being left at the site at this uh, facility. So, I made arrangements to go out there and visit the facility. At the time it was David Gwines, he was the site manager and Pam West, she was the director of that facility. Just so, just so happens that the day I ventured out there, Voice of America was there, the news organization. And we were walking about and I was walking with them. So they were coming, they were showing us these objects that had been left. There were uniforms. I remember this, particularly the uh, pajamas, which was set pajamas there, and no one knew what they were. And because I spent so much time in the hospitals, VA hospitals, I recognized the pajamas, the patterns immediately. And I expressed my opinion that these were uh, uh, VA hospital pajamas. So then there were some other objects in the collection. No one knew, none of, no one on the tour knew what they were. I knew what they were. I told them, well, this is a souvenir object. This is whatever, this is whatever. Unbeknownst to me, when I left and went home, David Gwines, who was the site manager then, checked up on everything I said. He verified everything I said and realized that I knew what I was talking about. So he got in contact with me, he and Pam wanted to know if I wanted to come out there and help them organize all this. You have to understand there was nothing. It was just madness. No one knew what this stuff was. It was just a, a pile of objects, things. So I started talking with the members of the chapter, Vietnam Veterans of America. So we would come out there on the weekend at the time the facility was open on the weekend we would come out on the weekend and we would start organizing these things and we start taking a lot of things and I was so fortunate is that the people coming out were different had been in bit different branches of the military during that time frame so for example we had Paul Fitzgerald he had been a medic uh, for what it's worth, he passed away of Agent Orange related uh, during that time frame. It was Bob Lloyd. He was the uh, he was the writer. He was the one who would write to Congress members or whatever about the importance of this uh, uh, this collection in the aborning, which hadn't been there. This uh, potential, this kinetic energy and all this collection. Jerry, so you there. guys were all, you the Vietnam Veterans of America, you guys were going out there together to identify the objects. Were you employed by the Park Service then or was this just like no. a group of guys? No, just a volunteer. We just come out there and volunteer because no one knew what, the, no one knew what the hell this stuff was. I'm be honest with you. It was just, I can't put, it was a blind side. From what I can understand and all the research I've done, that this is the first time, at least within US modern history, that the public really was worldwide. Let me back up. This was worldwide, in which the worldwide community had started leaving things at a public site over a protracted period. That was it, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Collection. It also uh, started a lot of. Uh, a precedent for a lot of other collections which were to come. No one, again, no one saw this because this was so 
radical. This was so unusual. So we used to do things like, um, because of my position and I was the, I was the front person, I was the front person. So they would, uh, sometimes they would have, uh, I think it was the National Archives. I'm trying to remember anyway, it may have been National Archives. So there were plants out in the audience. I'm gonna be candid with you, Kelly. So they would ask questions like, uh, they would throw questions out at the, uh, uh, a stage like, when is the National Park Service going to make this a collection? Okay. <laughs> do you think those those plants, those people, do you think that helped push it towards becoming a collection? Yes, because no one knew outside of this group, no one knew about this, really. No, yeah. even within the National Park Service in the uh in the chain in the chain of command. No one knew about the collection. What they knew about it was just some stuff out there. Yeah. yeah. When when they happened. when they started it as a collection, did they reach out to you to to be the person to to run it? Yes. And again, I always tell people, look, okay, because of my situation, okay, I'm a Vietnam veteran, combat veteran from Washington, D.C. Went up there during the 60s when everything was the city was a flame and all these other things. I was viewing the collection and one of the things that I start, as we started formulating policies and some of the things I emphasized because of my mother and what she was had gone through when I was in service. And I said, I want there to be sensitivity to these objects. I want there to be, um, I want you to view these objects that everything that comes here, you may, it may not have monetary value, such as gold or silver, but the donor is deciding that, that this is important to me, this donor. And that was very important. I did not want it, these objects to be discounted because I may not have understood something. Also, I realized that the knowledge that we were bringing, the veterans were bringing, may not coincide with what the, the, the actions of the donor. That's very important to understand that. As I dealt with the collection over a period of time, I also started to realize that you may have an object, but it has different meanings from uh, the origin of the object or the person leaving it, just like the, the descriptor or the name given to an object. I'll give an example of uh, pom poms, what I call pom poms. Okay, you know, growing up and he had the cheerleaders and have pom poms. Okay, I realized that in some parts of the country, they're known as warm fuzzies. And they're given to you. I'll give you, Callie, this warm fuzzy. It's a sign of friendship. Now that's peculiar to that part of the country. I think it was around the Midwest the memory serves. But understand even the language. I know it as a pom pom, but in some parts of the country, it's known as a warm fuzzy. The meaning of it changes. It's more than just an accessory of being a cheerleader. Now it becomes this term of affection. So you understand the complications of all this. So I would make notes that yes, it's the pom pom, but it's also known as a warm fuzzy or whatever. And that was very important. And also, you know, it was so many things like that, just like a, what we call sold, well, what I call a soda here on the East Coast in this area and other parts of the country is known as a pop. So we had to deal, uh, well, we had to deal with all of these issues and trying to formalize it. Then we have the military proper, oh my gosh. Okay, you may have a term for the army that's not, it's similar object, but the Marine Corps may have a different name for it. The Air Force may have a different name for it. So when we were trying to catalog all these things, <clears throat> excuse me, 
I had to decide on a basic beginning. Okay, this will be headgear. We're going to start with the term headgear. Then if it's Marine Corps, it becomes a cover. Okay. I had to keep saying, breaking it down for each branch of the service. And that was very important. I told people, you know, that's very important. Also, what I discovered is that when I came into the service, at the time, at least in the Army, when you first hit the country, you went from a slick sleeve. A slick sleeve was that you really didn't have any rank. You're just a, a, a P, a private, private. Okay, you automatically uh, rose in rank to PFC, which was a singular uh, Chevron, invert, inverted V Chevron. Now through the years that designate has changed. So I tell people, you have to understand the time, the, the, the time frame when this was left, what was it known as? Just like a specialist for, they're not using that term. It's now just a specialist. So if something comes in, if a, a garment would come in, a piece of uniform, and it had a PFC on it, is it a PF, is it a private or is it a PFC? It's, the t it's time related. It's locked in. This is what it was known during that time. And that's why I'm putting the language because everything evolves. Yeah. Then I look at the footwear. That's another example. I tell people, very important to understand that footwear. As the war wore on, they, they were using double buckle uh, combat boots from uh, well, Korea to Vietnam, and they, but they were deteriorating because of the age and also because of the uh, humidity of Vietnam, depending on where you were serving. Okay, so they started changing to the, uh, the green combat boots. Uh, the iconic, but what happened, if you look at the soles, you'll see the difference because what happened is they started making them uh, uh, puncture proof because of the uh, booby traps and whatever. Then they did a lot of things. So he saw this evolution, the same as with the uniform, the uh, jungle fatigues, they started going with uh, uh, was it, uh, rip stock because the jungles were so violent and vicious, they were tearing uniforms up. So they went to rip stop. So if you look at something, you see them getting rid of the epilepsy and other things because they were hanging up in the bush. So again, this is part of the evolution. And that's what's so important. And I tell people, you know, if you understand this, you really look at uniforms and tell that it was probably during this time frame. Just like if you look at the name tags and name tapes on a uniform, they went from really quite uh, distinguishable, uh, was it white, uh, before they moved to um, uh, muted, um, camouflage, uh, because of the jungle. Yeah. Dury, do so you think all of, of the unit? Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, all of these things, do you think they, they tell different stories in the collection? They tell different stories, and that's why it's so important. I want to tell people, I used to laugh at this Time Magazine uh, commercial. This was during the early part of Vietnam. They had a series of books. It's called uh, The Vietnam Experience. And I used to tell people, I said, they're telling a damn lie. There's no such thing as a Vietnam experience. You know why, Callie? Your experience, your experience varied according to when you were in Vietnam, where you were in Vietnam. Vietnam was divided into four areas, I Corps, two Corps, three Corps, four Corps. My friend who was in Marine Corps was up there by the DMZ. He told me he never saw rice paddies. I lived in rice paddies. I didn't know there was a beach until the um, TV series. I never saw a beach, not in Vietnam. The areas were different. You had the mountains, then you go down south. That was the uh, bread basket for Vietnam. That's where, uh, 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 you know, uh, the, the Mekong Delta and stuff. That was a different war. I always tell people, you have to understand that. What were you doing in Vietnam during that time frame? Were you a cook? Were you uh, 
uh, great, what we then call graves registration, where you combat, where you're a pilot, it varied. Then you had the people who were flying out of Thailand, where a lot of the uh, uh, jets were flying out. Then you had Guam, where the B-52s were flying out. It was a different experience. Then what year were you there? Well, if you were there before Tet, that was probably the height of patriotism. After Tet, man, no one wanted to be the last person to die in Vietnam. Everything changed. So I always tell people, there's no such thing as a Vietnam experience. The Vietnam experiences depend upon when you were there. What yeah. were you doing there? And that's very important to understand that. Yeah. Jerry, do you think like that's why the collection is so diverse? Because like um the experiences are so diverse do you think that's that that is kind of rings true to the collection that rings true to the collection also you have to under, also consider the uh inter, it was an international force in many ways it was just not the united states you had the australians you had the uh ties you had the uh, south koreans you had other people making contributions but they weren't um i think it was saudi I think it was Saudi Arabia, they contributed a bunch of uh, sardines. I think Spain had a medical uh, staff. So they weren't combat, but they were contributing. So this is part of it. Plus it's international in scope. And I tell people, if you look at what's known as the home of records, this is something, I mean, it's just, you lose your mind trying to understand home of records. Okay, I'm from Washington, DC. I, I was drafted from Washington, D.C., and, and I returned to Washington, D.C. So my home of records are Washington, D.C. Now, I've spoken to people who were from other countries. I'm talking about home of records. Their home of records may not reflect that they were from England. They may reflect that they were from Silver Spring or Iowa or whatever. That, but it was, that war really was international in scope in so many ways. Yeah. Beyond, right. So in understanding that, then you understand why, look, we have all these things coming in. And thank God I had this group of veterans who were really around the world. And I'll give an example. China had just opened up, recently opened. So we, we received this, uh, some coins and I know that it had the uh, picture of Mao Zedong on some of the coins, but it was written in Mandarin. Now, everyone I knew spoke Cantonese, so I had to make a copy of it, send it out across seas and whatever. So this, the image went all the way across seas. So it came back and said, Jury, the gist of this um, coin is, may Mao live a thousand years or long live Mao, uh, Mao Zedong, okay? You understand? So all of a sudden, we're getting all these foreign things in. But it's because, you know, you had all these people, it was just not Americans in Vietnam. So everyone is leaving something that's peculiar to them. So even become, if you're trying to understand or maintain the end, integrity of the collection, man, I had to go the extra mile, but thank God I had, I had a supporting cast. And I tell people, look, I'm just the front person. I have a lot of people in the rear who were helping me. Okay. Cause it's impossible for one person to know everything that was coming into this collection. It was impossible, yeah. but I had people who were trying to help me in maintaining the integrity of it. Kelly, I'll tell you something else. Okay, as we speak, all these things come to me, so you have to just bear with me. No worries, you're good, Dory. Okay. We have insignias, patches in the collection. I tell people now. You never, okay. You have what's called the divisional patch, like 1st Infantry Division, 101st Airborne Division, 1st uh, Marine Division, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Within that group, you have these unofficial official insignias. Okay, a bunch of people, they've been drinking some beer, drinking some jet, I mean, a blackjack, 
So they decide to go to town to build and get some insignias made for that particular group. So there may be maybe 12 people who had this made. Now, there's an insignia in there and it's from one of the ships. I'm trying to remember all the details. So as I said, I've never heard of this group. So it came back to me. They said, Dury, this is the story on this particular insignia. This insignia was only worn by the fighter crew of then the USS Enterprise. So they went out and had this insignia made. It wouldn't be in any of the books, probably not any of the reference books, but probably maybe it was only a squad. And the only war between what, I can't remember what year to this year, that was it. That was common all through Vietnam. Do you know how many groups there were that, 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 that titled themselves, that were self-titled whatever, uh, uh, um, a veteran from, from DC or something, you know, like. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Jerry, you talked before about like the items, importance of the items and also referencing kind of like thing, like one thing that's important is like this, mothers are leaving these things behind. And obviously it's not just mothers, but mothers were someone, were groups of people who were coming down definitely and leaving things behind. Are there any items in particular left by a mother at the wall that um, are memorable for you? Oh yeah, uh, yes, uh, uh, Spanky. I think that was the lead person. This person really received a lot of attention. It was the uh, mother, uh, she had a son who was killed in Vietnam and his nickname was Spanky. So we noticed that there was this continuation of oh, Spanky, Spanky. I've spoken to her several times on the phone. I don't know if she is alive now because she was up in age at the time, but there were articles be, being written about the mother of Spanky. So you had this going on. Um, I also know as part of the evolution. Yeah. <laughs> oh God, okay. I have uh, one of the volunteers was a female. You probably know her. Her name was Nancy. That's all I would tell you. All right. Nancy had been in Vietnam. So Nancy used to come out to the facility and help help us uh, uh, sort through the objects. So I started noticing that the holidays started being articulated out there. We started seeing things like Christmas time, someone leave a Christmas card, something like that. Easter, someone will leave something like that. Okay, these holidays, uh, Thanksgiving, whatever. So I remember to this day when Nancy turned around and looked at me and said, Dury, Dury, you heathen you. There are more holidays in the year besides military. <laughs> there are family gathering days. I said, really? I said, really? Okay. I was thinking this military mindset, this thought. Nancy alerted me to the fact that there are, Dury Dury, you heathen you, there are more than just military holidays in the year. There are also family gathering days. So that was part of the evolution. We started seeing that, I started seeing that, that you had these family members and mothers leaving things for their kids. There were also things relating to that, I call it uh, dreams uh, deferred, dreams not realized. And we had started receiving pictures of uh, baby pictures and said it should have been our child or um, um, uh, uh, in your honor, I'm leaving my graduation book for my father, things like this. Now, we were, doing some things with um, on, the, on the memorial. They, they do the yearly thing, uh, what's it called? I can't think of the name of it, but it's an event they have every year on the memorial. At least they were having before this, before this uh, pandemic. And we used to send them, they would have, they said, do you have something for like a, from a mother to a son? I said, yeah, we have something in the collection. We'll send you a copy of it, whatever. 
we got thrown a monkey wrench. And Callie, do you know what that monkey wrench was? No. We had difficulty finding something left by a father to this son. A lot of things in it from the mothers, siblings, but the father were lacking. Yeah. I often thought about that. Kind of yeah. Strange, isn't it? it is, yeah. And it's sad and, and you know, um, no less heartbreaking, you know, for, for fathers, certainly. Um, Dury, were you there when they found the care package? Oh, uh, yeah, the care package. Okay, several care packages, but you're talking about the care package? I am, I, yeah, I'm talking about the care, I know, yes, there's cer probably certainly more than one, but I'm talking about the one, the Charles Stewart um, care package, yes. Yeah, I was there for that one, and I was explaining to the uh, staff, we had, uh, what would happen is we had, we had uh, interns who would come in, and they would be assigned to me in the collection. So this care package comes in. I don't even know if people, if care is still around, well, care is still around, but anyway, I had to explain to them about a care package. I say, you know, this is a nickname for these type of packages. I said, people would leave, would uh, send, send things home, send, send things from home to you, things that you like. My thing was Cracker Jacks. My mother would, family would always send me these boxes of Cracker Jacks. I said, when you see this package, I said, on the return, there's return address. I said, but memory serves, this one had a return to sender, uh, something about a, a, a casualty, KIA killed in action, something like that. I said, and that was very important. I said, we had, there's a lot of correspondence in here with that. You see up there on, on the corner, it's normally stamped, return to sender, um, a KIA deceased or something to that nature. But I tell people, this package is very important. Now, when I left that pack, that particular package had not been opened. And that's one of the things we would try to do, not not open the packages, but I know in time they probably have to be open because of preservation, because some of the things may have uh, canned uh, tomato juice in it or whatever. Well, that's corrosive and it make the, uh, or the can explode in, certain, in time, which would just jeopardize everything in that packaging. But that was another example of, of, of that, that care package. And it was kind of strange when a care package arrived, everyone within your squad, let's say your squad, knew what was going to be in that package. All right. So don't try to hide it because they knew. Because you received that package, you knew it was going to be cookies. And in my, in my case, they knew there were going to be Cracker Jacks in it. Yeah. Right. Jerry, um, you were drafted in, were you in 1967 or 68, was it? No, no. I was... I was caught up in what's known as the big draft of 1966. That's right. the term that's used, the big draft of 1966. And that's when Westmoreland said, I, there's light at the end of the tunnel and I just need X amount of people and we'll be home by Christmas. Yeah. I came out of high school and uh, see in June, I was, uh, drafted in November after after I had been uh, turned down for physical reasons. You ready for that? Yeah. Did you did you try to volunteer? Yes, I tried to get in the, the Navy and the Air Force. They pulled me off the bus saying I had some physical uh, uh, deformity. This is a true story. It was a messed up time. Okay. In D.C., we had the uh, recruitment station. It was multi- uh, services. I'm gonna give you the address: 916 G Street Northwest. <laughs> Greetings. You are hereby inducted into the United States military. You will report as uh, or, or, 
old 600 hours to 916 G Street Northwest, you will bring with you, yada, 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 yada. Okay. I always tell people this story. <coughs> Excuse me. Other people have verified similar. Okay. We're standing in line. No one knows what's going to happen. Everybody's just standing up there in their, uh, in their underwear. All right, so I remember being in the Army part. So again, I said it was multi uh, uh, um, branch of service. So in this building, you had like the Air Force, uh, I think it was the Navy, and the, the Army Marine Corps. So this recruiter comes down the hallway into the room, United States Marine Corps. And he says something to the effect of count off by four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So he said, every fourth man step forward. He said, follow me, you are now in the United States Marine Corps. True story, so help me. I tell people, that is a true story, so help me. Okay. Now, why? That's one of the It was a sweet job to think about. He didn't have to go out and beat the bushes trying to find a recruit. He knew when a, a, a new group was coming in, all he had to do was walk out the office, go down the hallway, and recruit right there. And it wasn't what it wasn't, do you want to join the Marines? It's count off by four. Yeah. Every fourth man, follow me. You are now in the United States Marine Corps. This is this is that time frame back then. I talked about the big draft of 1966. Callie, I have friends today, to this day, we still speak and we talk about how many people have disappeared. We went to school with, and, she, and the person said, you know, I've often wondered about that. And I told her, I said, Murray, you have to understand or consider how many of those people got drafted? How many people, because they were discharged, um, uh, uh, maybe in California or whatever, they decided to stay there in California or whatever. I said, because I got hit, I was discharged back here to Walter Reed. I was back here in DC. So in many ways I was fortunate, but I was unfortunate in that I got hit. But because I was in DC, I was discharged back to DC. So I didn't have the problems with uh, wanting to go home, which had probably had a lot to do with how I considered the collection. Because I was here in DC. I had visitors all the time. It wasn't a you know, big deal, but right. I know being in there and you had, and, and there were people from other states. It was emotional. Uh, uh, it was emotional for them. Now I've always remembered that. But like I said, that was the time frame, 1966. The world, I always think of uh, General Cornwallis and uh, um, oh, doggone it. Well, uh, uh, doggone, I can't remember. Any, anyway, the British had surrendered to Washington. And I always tell people, I said, you had this mighty army, the British army. I said, they fouled out under the command of General Cornwallis. The fife and drum were uh, playing. The world turned upside down. And I say, you have to understand that time frame. The world was turned upside down. So many things were going on. I always tell people about the social changes, Kelly. And this is, I'm going to give you these social changes so you have to understand everything that was hitting. TV went from black and white to color. That was a big deal. NBC used to have this peacock and it would say, the upcoming program is brought to you in living color. And it was Peacock was strut out there and, and show his feathers, okay. The movie started changing. I tell people, look, the first movie, I said, young lady took me to see uh, uh, The Wild Bunch. Now, when I left, I was watching things like Shane and Ride the High Country. You have to understand that. And Roy Rogers, all right. All of a sudden, I'm looking at The Wild Bunch. You have to understand, this is uh, Peckin, uh, Peckin Paul, I think his name is. It's like, what the hell happened? What did I just miss? You know, what what did I just miss? Okay, 
the music started changing. You had what's called conceptual music. I said, prior to that, most music you heard on the radio was about three minutes, about three minutes duration. I said, what happened is at the end, it would, if, you, if you're a musician, it's called worrying the line. But, uh, the, the music would fade out and the singer would be saying, yeah, Kelly, I love you, baby. Please come back home. You know, yeah, I'll give you all my money. The music would fade out. What happened during that time, it became abrupt. The music would cut off, bam. That was one of the changes. Also, the music started moving, the music started moving from AM to FM. Then you had the conceptual music, such as uh, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On. We have an album of music that was completely new. What's going on? I was telling people, Marvin Gaye, what's going on? What's going on? That was inspired by brother Frankie, who was in Vietnam. And Motown was hesitant about releasing that song because it was so radical. It was not Motown, if you understand what Motown was doing back then. Chubby Checker is a big thing. Chubby Checker is considered, at least in modern music, that the twist, man, it was considered radical. I mean, it was just, oh man, no one's doing the twist. JFK's uh, secretary came out to the public and said, our president, JFK, was not doing the twist at the White House. Was not doing the twist at the White House. The twist is considered the first modern uh, song in which people dance without touching. Did you know that? It was a big deal. Also, you have pantyhose. And I tell people everything that was going on. I said, you had these mini skirts that were being introduced, that had been introduced. I said, about the same time, pantyhose for women were being introduced. I said, what happened is that the pantyhose encouraged women to wear the mini skirts because of modesty. So you see all these things that were going on. This is like, okay. These are the things I was returning to. I remember going to, someone took me to a party. I came back from Vietnam. I would tell people, look, you watch uh, 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 Tarantino. Oh God, uh, oh God. He did a movie with uh, Samuel Jackson. I can't think of the name of it. They were two hip men. Um, can't think of the name of the movie. Oh, God. Oh, uh, anyway. Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction. Okay, I tell people about this. I said, man, let me tell you something. I said, Tarantino was on Jay Leno's show one night. And Tarantino is from, uh, I mean, not Tarantino, uh, Travolta is like from the New Jersey area. So he was explaining this dance called the Batman. Okay, if you talk to people today, they call this action, they call it the Tarantino, the Pulp Fiction dance. I said, no, it was the Batman because that was the mask. I said, the first dance I went to coming back, they were in there doing this, the Batman. Da, 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 da. That was the Batman. But it made me realize that someone had written a, a paper that dances are local. This is something else. Just like, let's, uh, let's go to the hop, though, baby. Let's go home to the hop. The original words were, let's go to the bop. But the producers felt that it would be too localized. So they changed it to let's go to the hop because it was it was local. It's the same way as this collection. The language and everything, a lot of it is, is local. A lot of it is peculiar to a certain country. Uh, uh, the mindset, you have to understand. Yeah, they're pom-poms to me. They're pom -pom. Yeah, go out there, you know. Yeah, 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 come on, school, come on. But someone gives it to you. Depends on when they give it to you, it's a sign of affection. Yeah. Dari, yeah. When you were, so you, when you were drafted and you were in Vietnam, how did you become a radio operator? Was that something you were just chosen for? So long ago. I, I may, have, may have been chosen for, or yeah, they were looking for certain people. Yeah. I was told you had to have, oh man, not get excited and a lot of other things. I'm trying yeah. to 
you had to, I'm sure you had to be very calm to be a radio operator, right? You had to do a lot of different things in one time. Yeah, plus they had a high casualty rate. Yeah. But I always tell people about an ambush. I say an ambush, I said, at least during the time, I said, the people who are normally neutralized at the moment of an ambush is your leadership. Always understand that. You always take out the leader. That's what Stalin did with the uh, Polish uh, officers in World War II, took out the leaders. Then you take out the, uh, the medic or the corpsman if you're in the Navy, Marines, corpsman, medic, take them out. That's one of the things that the uh, NBA use, learned. They, used, they learned enough English to say, uh, medics forward, <laughs> then they shoot them. Then you had the uh, machine gunner, the M60, because that was your artillery. That was that would bring out the firepower, that machine gunner. Then you had the RTO. I tell people, yeah, that's communication. Everything is about communication. When you wake up in the morning and check the weather, that's about communication. When you, uh, you know, the old saying, as long as there's as long as his breath in his lungs, the message leaves. And that's one of the reasons that when they hit runners or whatever, they would kill them. They would strafe them. The enemy would strafe them. Because as long as their lungs, air in his lungs, the message lives. That communication was uh, utmost important. You take out that radio and you're down in the woods someplace, you don't know where you are outside of this map, red map. They don't know what was happening in the rear. So you always take those out immediately. They were thinking that sometimes they would put the medic with him. They were controlled, they put them like in the center, like in the RTO. I know they would start to notice where they would push, where they would position me. Now starting to make now it makes sense. Also, something else, Kelly, that I really thought about through the years. I was with the first infantry division and because I was RTO, I had to be, I forgot how many steps behind my uh, Louis, behind the uh, lieutenant, can't remember. But anyway, I remember this, and I really think about this. I said, you would hear the sounds of an ambush. Hello? Okay, back. okay. Can you yep, hear me? Okay. I can hear you good, Dory, thank you. Okay, you would hear the sounds of an ambush. I mean, uh, small arms fire, the, the, the Claymore mines, you know, they use Claymore mines. I'll capture once. He knew it was an ambush. I said, now, one of the things I started noticing is I would look for the plume of the smoke. That meant that the RTO had been hit because the grenades went up, the smoke grenades went off. And then the radios would just light up with whatever the call sign had been hit, just ambushed. I tell people now, these people, if I saw them in the street today or even then, I would not know them, but I knew their voice. Then just think about it. All right, we're sitting there. And I look for the, if I see the plume, I know that the an RTO had been hit. I did not know them, but I knew their voice and the call signals. Yeah. Looking back. Okay. Yeah. Jerry, you told me once a story about some le a leadership, someone in leadership that you was not maybe very popular in your unit, who you had to stay in some a foxhole with or something. Uh, so many people. Oh my God. Oh, maybe it's okay. I'd be careful about this. The military, the military started experiencing fragging. That's when you had these, okay. We call them shake and bakes. Okay, you had, because the military was so desperate for officers and helicopter pilots, they were shaking and baking them. That's like they're in the mama's course. 
They send them, they send them to Vietnam and Cuba. Okay, the officers wanted to get their, what's called their tickets punched. Okay, so they would want to do like six months to put it, to get something on their record for promotion. So they call it getting the tickets punched. So they may come out for six months or whatever. They didn't know what the hell was going on. So I know it was one of Louis came out. And I remember this particular case. We were getting ready to cross this river. And he was going to have everyone just cross the river. I said, sir. Okay, did come are we back? Hello? Hello? Hi, Dury. We lost you for a second, um, but you're back now. You were just talking about you had an officer, something about a river, and then it just cut out. Two officers, okay. Second, he was new. Okay. We crossed this river. So he was just going to for all the band. And, and above my head is the stored bubble. I'm saying, you MF, okay, you dumb MF, you. This is the thought bubble above my head. Like, but I'm Hang saying, on. sorry, sir, Dury, I'm Dury, I'm sorry. It just totally cut you off at the very beginning of your story. I'm really sorry. Do you mind starting over so we can hear you? Okay. I don't know why it cut you off. I'm sorry. All right. We we had this second Louis. Okay. So the Louis was going to have us cross this river, but we were going to do it in tandem, just going across the river. So I'm the RTO. So I said, sir. I said, nice. I said, sir. And then there's this thought bubble above my head, like in the comic strip. And I'm saying to myself, you dumb MF you. Let me let me get you straight. I said, sir. I said, may I suggest that you send part of the group over, part of the squad over to secure the other side in the event we get hit. You don't want to get hit crossing a river. Okay. So he was amenable to that. And I always remember him that he was like completely different. I think he realized that he was in over his head. You know, this, that, that real war apocryphal story about the second Lieutenant coming in <clears throat> to a new command and the guys was lying about resting and he asked which way is to the war and they point around the corner and they said around the corner he said oh yeah so he goes around the corner and they they said he's greeted with the greeted by the sound of machine gun <laughs> all right now i'll be very careful how i say this story. we had this other officer okay so it's another RTO. I know the other RTO. Okay. So they were trying to frag this man. I don't know. So you, you would hear this sound of a grenade going off, but they were always missing him. So what happened is <clears throat> he got wise and he started dragging the other RTO to the latrine with him, the bathroom with him. His uh, uh, sleeping area, because it was understood that to, in order to get him, you'd have to get the RTO, who was well known. This is how messed up that time frame was. It was, I think people started realizing, like I tell people, look, my few times going to town. I said very few times because I uh, went on R&R &R or whatever, and you have to go through uh, Saigon, whatever, to get to the airport. I said, I was looking at all these young men on, on uh, motor pads. I was like, man, why aren't they out here with us rather than in town riding these mopeds? Something's not right with this. So even back then, we were, I mean, we just wasn't, it was, it was just wasn't I who, who were questioning the, all this. We started questioning way back then. 
So I can only imagine after Tet, when, like I said, the pendulum starts swinging the other way and that thing with uh, Walter Cronkite, the uh, news anchor who made that famous statement to the effect, I thought we were winning this war. And that's when LBJ allegedly said, we've lost the war because of Cronkite. Jerry, I want to um, I want to ask you a few questions because we're coming up on the 40th anniversary of the memorial, which is All crazy right. to think about. Um, so, tell us about your feelings about the memorial now. What are what are, what are your feelings about the memorial now? About the memorial? Yeah, 40 years later. That memorial has, as far as I, the memorial has passed the test of time. That is to say, I feel that it's not something that was like a, uh, what's the term, a fad. That people are still interacting with this memorial, even in, in the midst of this uh, pandemic, which is hell of a statement, really, that really is. People are still leaving things. But because of that memorial, and I feel it has inspired so many other memorials really throughout the world, because I've gotten contact from uh, curate, uh, museum curators and whatever about the collection. Uh, it inspired the 9-11 uh, memorial, because we went up there to discuss the memorial there, uh, all about the world. I always tell people something else, and it's very important to understand. The public decides what's going to be the memorial to whatever the circumstances, whatever the public decides. If you understand that there across the United States, there are many memorials, some of them have fallen into states of disrepair, but they're to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. But the memorial is considered the one in National Mall, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. But think about this, all these other memorials throughout the United States, the public has decided for whatever reason that this will be the memorial as regards yeah. to Vietnam. Yeah, Dury, you know, something that's really important um, is the distinguish, be, distinguishing between this is the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, not as some people call it, the Vietnam War Memorial. Why do uh, you think, why do you think that distinction is so important? And why we went out of our way when we had to come up with the proper name for the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Collection Fund. The war was this, we, the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Collection is the consequence of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial, which is a consequence of the Vietnam War. So we took the name all the way through to the collection. We honored that. The reason that there's no war, term war, is that when you say war, it people there's a connotation that this may be a uh, celebration of the war or whatever, but it's not. So it's not ended. The, the, the wall is supposed to make um, a non-political uh, statement, but someone told me something that encountered that and I really had to think about it. There's nothing on the wall that says uh, we were right, we were wrong, whatever. These these people died in vain, and then you have the people in the uh, uh, as it goes to the memory. Hey, Jerry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Your I your what you're saying is so valuable, and your sound completely cut out. Um, and it cut out at the point. I'm sorry. Uh, it cut no out problem. at the point. Uh, if you could just kind of reference back to where you were saying about when the wall was built, there's there's no writing on the wall that says blank. I think that's exactly where it cut out. Right. There's no statement as to the posture of the United States that we were right, we were wrong, we were trying to fight communists, whatever, whatever. That's absent. 
that's why the term war memorial is not in there because if you have war if you have the vietnam veterans war memorial war there's a connotation you don't want that because this memorial is to bring about national reconciliation that's one of the things it's supposed to do that is why the term war is absent it's about national reconciliation this memorial also outside of the government uh, 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 donating the land, that wall was built really by public uh, uh, contributions. That's very important to understand that. It was the public to say, well, look, we're going to raise the money for this Vietnam veteran, for a Vietnam veterans memorial. That was part of it. But someone told me something, uh, something. They said, Dury, it may not explicitly make a comment about the conduct of the war but if you look at those names up there it's telling you the cost of war i never thought about that someone brought that up but explicitly it doesn't there's nothing that says we were right we were wrong this is why we went whatever there's nothing like that but look at those names that's the cost of war of that particular war at least yeah so during what what would you want a visitor 40 years from now to know about the memorial, right? We're 40 years out, but in another 40 years, even, what would you want them to know about the memorial? That there was an impact upon that generation. More than that generation, because there's a concentric circle when people die or there's a major event, there's a concentric circle that's set up, same as throwing a rock into a pond or whatever, you see the ripples going out. It's the same thing. And you have all these associated events associated with that war, but it's no different from any other war. Just like what's going on now with the Afghan uh, uh, Iraq war, it's the it's the same feelings. The same those people are going through the same things that the Vietnam veterans went through. The only thing about it is that memorial probably you know it's a turning point how the, the public as a whole perceived the veteran because we went from um, we, we went to uh, uh, don't um, divest in the war from the war. That's very important to understand. That was a big thing because now you walk around, you say, thank you for your service. I go to the VA hospital, it's thank you for your service. That was missing when I came home. But I, one of the, the things I think that came out of that memorial is this re-examining of this conflict we are the, I'm the warrior, I'm not the war. Don't divest the warrior from the war. Jerry, could you say that one more time? Because I just missed the end that I, you started with, I'm the. Oh God, okay. I'm the warrior. I'm the, war, I'm the warrior, I'm not the war. Divest the warrior from, divest the warrior from the war. Yeah. You have people who coming in the airports now, in the main, they're greeted. We appreciate your service. I'm telling you, one time, look, when I got out to serve, we were told not to wear your uniform in, 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 uh, um, in public. It was, that was the mindset. I'll tell you this story real quick. Um, when I was, at, I was at Fort Meade, Fort George G. Meade, bro. And what we had to do, we call it clearing post. When you get ready to uh, get out the service, they give you this laundry list. You know, you had to go to the library and they check it out. You don't have any books in here. Go to the laundry mat. You know, you don't have any clothes in the laundry mat. Yada, yada, yada. Okay. So one of the things the military wanted was the uh, dress green uniform, which no one really had. You've been to Vietnam. Who the hell knows what that is? So what you would do is go into the latrine, the bathroom. 
and you look in the trash cans and, the, and on the floor. And if you need a pair of slacks or pants or a jacket, you pick it up. They didn't care about the size. They just wanted uh, um, this clothing. And that's how a lot of people got their clothing. Because people were, were stripping themselves of the military guard and putting on civilian. They just told, throw the military stuff away. That was, that's what was going on back then. And we were being told, don't wear your civvies, don't wear your military uh, in public. Yeah. You know, Jerry, I think, you know, you said there's no one Vietnam War experience, right? There's Vietnam War experiences. No. But if you, if you could say something that people should know about Vietnam veterans, um, what is, what, what, and it, you, you can, I guess you could apply it to yourself or it just, you could say in general, what is, what is something that you think people should know? That the uh, mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, but that person you knew prior to Vietnam is not the same person that returned from Vietnam. Jerry, and this is, I, I don't really have any questions after this, but also if there's anything that I didn't ask you that you think you should share, please let me know. But can you tell me, at, so we talked a little bit about the memorial before it was built. Can you tell me a little bit um, about your first visit to the memorial when it was built? Mm. When it was built, I guess that'd be dedication. That'd be formal. Yeah. That'd, that'd be dedication. That was in uh, 82. And then it was cold in November. And uh, one of the corrections I used to make is with the press, they would always put that dedication date was November the 11th. I said, no, it was November the 13th on a Saturday. I said, that was done deliberately to give people time to get to the wall. Uh, uh, but also about finance because the uh, economy was not in that great a shape. So with that exception, that was, November the 13th on a Saturday and it shut down the traffic around the, the National Mall. I remember that one. I remember it was cold and I remember that uh, it was a big debate about how the veterans should march. That is to say, should they march by divisions? Should they march by uh, uh, home of records? Uh, there were some other things, you know, hey, Vietnam, nothing's ever easy. So, I just remember walking down, uh, walking down the street, and people on the side cheering us and whatever. But I just can't, and I just remember, you know, it's kind of strange. And they were think, debating, you know, we should walk, we should march as a division. No, we should march by state. No, we should march by whatever, whatever, whatever. So, uh, isn't it funny that like forty years from from that day? There's, I, I've talked to so many people about, you know, about different things that they remember on that day mm -hmm. and that's never come up. And, and it's, it's great that that to me that you were, that that's something you remember. Um, but at the same time, you know, like it, it's important and looking back on it, it's not, you know what I mean? It's not. Right, like it, the fact that it, that they were there, that's what's important. They the were there, that that's what's important. But right. again, it was like, okay, but yeah, but we want to march by division. Okay, first infantry division, 101st, first cab, whatever, whatever. No, but we want to march by uh, 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 state. So I think everyone just, they just funneled to where they were comfortable. Again, it was back in the 1980s. Um, something else you didn't ask, and that was the great compromise. And I tell people that if it were not for the three-man statue or the uh, men in service statue, whatever term you want to use, there would not be 
a Vietnam Veterans Memorial as we know it. Because it was a Ross Perot. He, he, had, he had a lot of juice, a lot of power. And he wanted a historic traditional type of memorial. So the compromise would be that there would be a traditional type of memorial, the free man statue. That's why you have that memorial. Because at the time, that memorial was considered radical. But because of that compromise, which became 1984, the addition of the three man statue. Yeah. Uh, right. I also tell people this. I I met the sculptor, uh, doggone it, my mind went by. Uh, Frederick Hart is yeah, Frederick, Hart. Frederick Hart. Yeah, Frederick, yeah. Frederick Hart. He told me this. And I tell people this is the irony of this collection. I said, now you have this non traditional type of memorial from the time frame. I said, it has a, it has a, a name. I said, Mile Lynn gave it a name Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Frederick Hart told me that this traditional memorial, this historic memorial, does not have a formal name. He never gave it a formal name. That's it's why I was through servicemen. Right. Doesn't that, is not formally named. That's what he told me. He said he never gave it a formal name. Now you would think that this historic traditional memorial right. would have a you know, I, I, I titled the the what right. a three man statue, fighting man statue, whatever. That's why it responds to so many names. Yeah. But you have this untraditional memorial that has a name. Go figure. It's Vietnam. I can tell me, look, the, it's the world turned upside down. I used to tell the press people and researchers when they come to the facility, leave your logic at the door because you're dealing with Vietnam and there's no logic. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. Okay. You're dealing with Vietnam. There's no logic. Leave it at the door. When you come in here, everything is counterintuitive. Yeah. Jury, um, so were you around when they, I mean, obviously you were, but were you around still like working at, were you down at the wall a lot still when they started with the Women's Memorial? Do you remember like that process? Oh, yes. And I know the, uh, oh, God. Oh, man. Um, I know the driver. He was a, a, a chapter member. He was the one who, uh, oh, man. He pursued, he persuaded, I can't remember, was FedEx or UPS? I, forgive me for this. But I think it's FedEx. Is that, are you talking about Fred, the Vietnam veteran? Fred, whatever. He drove the memorial across the country. Okay, can we? Okay, he told yeah. me that they responded by uh, upgrading the truck. That is to put, uh, uh, make it more um, uh, robust to handle the weight and whatever. I can't right. remember. And he was telling me about. That. I said, "What?" He said, "Yeah." He said, "You know, they did that." because of the weight of the memorial, but they did it at their own expense. They took it upon themselves to do it. I said, well, that's great. You know, that's that's great. And I also remember, um, oh God, man, I shouldn't tell you this mess. Okay, the Women's Memorial. If you look at the memorial, the women are looking up in the sky because they, uh, you know, it's probably they're waiting for a medevac helicopter. God bless the women. All black, bless the medevac, because because of them, I'm still here today. Now, <laughs> oh God, they had to a clearing had to be made for the women to see into the sky, because prior it was blocked by the trees, and no one had considered you're looking up here but it's being blocked by trees. Yeah. You're going to have to clear out an area where they can see. Oh, my goodness. Was that a whole hoorah at, with the Park Service? I can't go into that, but I'm just letting you know that. That's think better. about this. Now, I want you to think. Now, I was medevac, so you know I would pick this up immediately. You know, yeah. I would pick this up. 
the hell are you looking at? Maybe bring in the daisy cutter or something and, and, and blow up an opening. So you have to look in the trees. They don't have to send out a penetrator or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. I, uh, look, uh, look, I'm, oh, God. oh, the stories I could tell. Anyway, that yeah. was one, one of the stories, but I'm glad that they, very important. Most, a lot of people, especially that time frame, they don't consider that women were in on the front line and they were subject to um death and um uh, death and, and and being injured there were really no front lines and I tell people you have to understand that war it was uh JFK understood JFK wasn't was president he was really responsible for the Green Berets um he understood that the next wars would not be these World War II set piece wars they'd be called what Napoleon would call not Napoleon, uh, Wellington called the, uh, when he was in the uh, uh, Peninsula Wars fighting Napoleon, he called them the Wars of the Fleas, guerrilla wars. He understood that. LBJ Ness, JFK, John Fitzgerald Kennedy understood that the future wars would be wars of the fleas. What country is that time is doing, going to confront the United States in a frontal. You'd be suicidal. The wars of the fleas, guerrilla wars to wear the enemy down, make them leave. Yeah. He's Dury, responsible for JF for the Green Berets. Yeah. Dury, it's funny. It's like you, you were drafted. Um, you ended up in Vietnam kind of circumstantially by being drafted. I mean, you, you, yeah, you you were you were drafted, you were chosen to to go, and you went. But then you have really spent your entire life in service to the memorial to veterans, to helping people better understand the 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 war and the warrior through these items, to helping people better understand their families. When you look back on that, like your you know eighteen year old, nineteen year old self. Like what, what is, I don't know, is, is there any, is there, is there a lot of times where you think like that, that is such a huge part of your life. Did you think when you were in Vietnam that it would, would be, or would continue to be? No, when I was in Vietnam. I was just thinking about trying to make tomorrow, <laughs> but in hindsight, looking back and Kelly, this is something I have considered many times and I've discussed this with many people. Vietnam, there were about 3 million, uh, almost 3 million people who were uh, in country. Vietnam was called in country. There were about eight, almost 8 million people who were in the military. I think about this. Out of that 8 million people, why is it that out of that 8 million people, within the 3 million people, I, the heavens picked me to be in this position. Think about that number. We got 8 million in the service. Of that 8 million, about three, almost 3 million were in Vietnam, in country. How in the world did I, why, why, how was I chosen to be in this position? This collection has altered, it has shaped memorials on a worldwide level. I don't know why, honest to goodness. Yeah, Dury, I think that's like a, an incredibly positive way of looking at it. <laughs> like perhaps the most positive attitude that you could have about it. Um, it's interesting because I think like, you you are you are someone who brings such incredible knowledge and background to the collection, and it's funny um, because we you know we can think about how the collection has shaped certainly shaped other collections and certainly shaped other memorials, but the collection it, it is it is something that has 
it is fundamentally shapes individuals and people's lives. You know, that care package to Charles Stewart is something that for my entire life, I will think about because Charles Stewart grew up the road, down the road, 30 miles from me in the upper peninsula of Michigan, which is the mm. middle of nowhere. And it's, a, you know, the population density is like, you know, nothing. And so here is this kid who is essentially, you know, not my neighbor, but might as well be my neighbor, um, who, who had this care package sent to him in Vietnam, who died in Vietnam, who had it sent back to his family, whose mother kept it, you know, and it's like, I can see all of the, through the, through these items, I think we, we empathize in a way that makes the names even more individual. I can find Charles Stewart's name on the wall in, in a matter of seconds. I know where it is on the very last panel because he died in 1972 at the very end of the war. Um, and so I think like, it's interesting to me. I think you, you are, the only person who could bring um, the perspectives that you have. Because when you talk about Vietnam experiences, everyone is individual and your individuality shaped, you know, shaped so much of, of how we, of how um, this collection came to be. And so I'm very thankful for that. Um, I wanna ask you one more question that kind of came to mind when I'm talking about this. Um, your mother is obviously someone who yeah. said she was holding these meetings um, in in her house. Um, and and you said like your interpretation of the collection was shaped by um, by referencing and thinking about and thinking about her. Um, was she? Was she someone who was obviously she was affected by your service in Vietnam? Can can you speak at all um, to to that experience for her? Oh God, you want it? You want it? All right, my mother. Okay. What's her name, Dury? Her name is Theresa T H E R E S S A Felton. And uh, this, we had this new, this thing called Vietnam Veterans of America. I mean, we used to have discussions all the time, the members about something's not right. I was aging on, and it was a uh, uh, dog on it, um, uh, PTSD, a lot of things we used to discuss. Anyway, I'm going to tell you this story. I've only shared this with you people, but I guess it's time to let the world know. I'm lying on the on the gurney and cutting off my uniform. And I'm starting to go into the death throes. You know what the death throes are? They try to give you an x-ray or something. You got people on the other side holding you down because you're shaking because you're getting ready to go out. So the doctor comes over. He says, I'm going to try to save your life. He said, if you wake up, you're going to have to hold your hand over your throat, fake the otomy. That's supposed to go on out, okay? No hands, hips, and butts. So I have all these people about, all these service organizations. Be very careful. I have to be careful about this. So he said, do you have a message? Well, I couldn't speak, so I pantomimed that I uh, pencil and paper, and I wrote a message to my mother. Because I knew my father being World War II veteran, I knew he'd be a little stronger. So I wrote, I said, Lord giveth and Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But I didn't think I was going to make it. All right. Now, I know I was under for some days, maybe weeks. So my mother ended up getting in contact with the Army about... Uh, about my status because she hadn't heard from me. So the army assured her he's fit, fit as a fiddle. Oh, damn lie. So my mother kept pressing. So anyway, she ended up going to Congress about my status. And that's when she found out 
They almost died. So my mother came over to war to read. So that's where they went. They went to, if you went to Japan, basically that meant you were on your way home. So what they were doing is they were bringing people in late at night, away from the cameras and away from the sunlight to Andrews Air Force Base. Then they sent you over to war to read. Now, someone told me something at her funeral, which I never knew. We have to understand how many years we're talking, long time. So she passed away. So at the funeral, one of her friends walked up to me. He said, they said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, okay. They said, your mother came up to Walter Reed to visit. I said, yeah. And she said she walked all through the wards looking for you. So she said, eventually she, asked, she inquired as to Dory Felton. And she said, one of the patients said, hey, he's over there, you walked past him several times. She didn't even recognize him. So I have this mixed feeling about the, the army because they never informed her. My mother had to go before Congress. Yeah. That's crazy, Dury. I'm letting you know. Yeah. There's a, there's a whole lot more stories. A whole a right. lot more. No. How's your how's your writing going? Oh, it's been on hold. I told you I had that heart thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the other mystery. I, my brothers and family were discussing that. I said, you I don't want to get into politics of it or whatever. I said. It's kind of strange. I said, the UK and Scotland are reporting, this is something else, this is nothing to do with the collection, about um, uh, heart ailments, about blood clots, whatever, having yeah. to do with inoculation. I said, it's kind of strange. I said, I was walking 50 miles a day and doing the whole thing, you know, wrestling the alligators and gorillas and whatever, and all of a sudden, I'm just having shortness of breath and whatever, and then I, I have a heart problem. What the hell's going on? So I'm still trying to recover my strength. I still haven't recovered, to be honest with you. Yeah, you're still working on it. I'm still working on it. One of the reasons, spending what little money I have on rehab in my house, because I said, you know what, I've earned it. It's costing a lot of money, but as I tell people, it's I'm worth it. Moving. Yeah, it's I'm, worth it. I'm going out here feet first. So. Do you have work. central air? Do you have central air, central heat in your place, or are you window units? No, I'm central air, central heat. This okay. house is this house is built before 1900, so. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, and it's in DC. It's in DC. I had to. I had to place rehab once. They're doing the outside. They're doing a lot of things on the outside, but this house had been cold. It had been. Uh, uh, we call it gas, you know, the gas fixtures. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had all of those removed. I said, I didn't, no, 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 I had to get out of here. Never blow yeah. me up. Fixiate yeah. me. But the house, I yeah. love the house. Um, I'm, like I said, I was throwing off a lot of things when I went into the hospital behind this um, heart issue. Yeah. Oh yeah. Dury. I mean, that's, that's serious business. I'm glad you went and got it looked at. Um, all right. Well, so yeah. What were you going to say? No, I said, I'm glad I did also because, um, man, it was, it was just weird. It's just been weird, but you know, I, I'm still here and I tell people it has given me also time to reflect and I also tell people this little ditty. I said, had I known then what I know now, I would have entered, entered into a taunting because everyone I served with that I've kept in contact are deceased. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, it's just strange. Everyone, I tell people that all of them died of strange cancers. So it's like, and again, that's another question I ask. I said, now I was yeah. patrolling with them falling in the same rice pad, going to the same, same river, being bitten by the same leeches and whatever. Why yeah. is it that they 
Honest to goodness, I thought about that. Hell, you have no idea how many times that I've considered that. Yeah, Same. I think a lot of people think about that, Dur. Yeah, you, you know, know out, of, out of eight million people, why am I in this position? I don't know. What did I do? Yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I don't think that. I actually don't think there's a good answer for that. Like, why? Why do some people? Why did some people feel the effects of Agent Orange immediately after Vietnam, and why? Now, so many years later, are there people who are still suffering with it? Um, why, you know, why did someone not come home as opposed to someone else? I don't think there's like, um, I don't believe personally, <laughs> this, is a, this is a very awkward conversation, but this is Callie getting real for you. I don't believe personally that there is there is a good reason for that. I, sometimes I just think like, and shit happens <laughs> yeah. and or shit doesn't happen and i man Dury, if there is if there is someone though if there i do believe though that the folks you know who get the opportunity or have the experience to live and come home and and mentally and physically are well enough to do it in a way where they can support others that it's valuable for them to do that. And so I think like maybe, you know, that could be part of the reason that you have found yourself doing this work for so long is because you came home, you were physically wounded and certainly like have, have lived through a lot of things, but you were able to, to do the work to help others. And so you, 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 felt, you felt a calling to do that. And I think that comes from being a native Washingtonian. I think that comes from your family. Your father is a World War II veteran, from your mother, certainly, from your siblings, but also from your experiences, you know? It's all, it's, it's all a value to that. Right, and uh, again, I've often thought about that really so many, so many times and just as with the chapter, um, yeah. How many times I was thrust forward because I because I had so much ex experience with the VA health system when the, whenever yeah. they go before Congress, <laughs> I, they'd always throw me. In well, the also, front. Dur, you're you're a good speaker. You know, you right. you you uh, you have. I mean, I know you already know this, but you have a wonderful speaking voice and you speak with authority. And so, and, and you know what you're talking about. So, and you're intelligent. So yes, they're absolutely going to choose you to go and, and to talk about this. And man, they were, they were people who were angry and they had every right to be angry. That's, a, that's an important thing too, you know? You know, I look at I look back at all the uh, improvements as I go to that particular VA, and I think about um, m my being the first person. You go up on my my yeah. because of me, my group of veterans is really the first group to have a ceremony at the wall. Can you believe that the VA is only what maybe? four miles away, I don't know, from the wall. Yeah. But yeah. this group of veterans is the first group to, to have ceremonies at that wall. I mean, yeah. at the wall. It's Think incredible. It's, it's incredible. incredible. It's a yeah. good thing. All you right. Know, so many things reflect. Yeah. That's true. That's true. Jerry, I'm going to let you go, but when you think of something that you're like, oh, I wanted to talk about that, that, or that, you're gonna drop me an email or a call and we'll just set it up again, okay? All right, very good, because knowing me, I digest this and say, I wish I had thought about this, the same as the uh, TV series, yeah. American Veteran. Um, yeah. Oh man, but I was just responding to their questions. So anyway, yeah. that's that, so that's done. And see what the new, what 20, what years this 2022 brings. Yeah, Dury, you you let me know, okay? Because I'm happy to call you again. That's not a problem. And we can get on Zoom. We can figure it out, okay? All right, very good. And I will let you know 
you know, down the road, as you know, we've been working on this podcast and down the road, there are pieces from this that I think would be valuable for people to hear. I will let you know if we decide to do that and, and, and where it would slip in. Okay. Okay. Quick, quick. I forgot. I made yeah. a note. Smithsonian. Look, we did the Smithsonian exhibition. Yeah. And uh, right. That was a big deal. And uh, one of the things we uh, decided, okay, they were trying to, the Smithsonian had their uh, golden child, which was this uh, the first lady gowns and stuff. Okay, man, we, we just blew them out the water. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, one of the things we decided is to not to have a uh, comment about the objects that we selected. No comment. So what we discovered, because I was tasked with standing there with Jennifer Jones Locke, who is the, uh, which is our liaison over there at American History. She's still there. You may want to speak with her, Jennifer Jones Locke, American History. Okay. And we would notice how people would, okay, you, you just make comment about the care package. Yeah. All right. Someone would come to that care package outside of Cali and they would have a story relating to that, that care package. Then someone else would come up and see that care package and they would have a different story. And we started understanding, well, reinforce that they're individual, but everyone carries with them their own meaning about this. And I think it was a great decision not to put a a, a comment, a placard, you know, this is a care package and this was, a, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Because everyone brings their experience with it. Just Kelly talking about that. Yeah. Right. I think that's, I think that's, I think that's important to, to recognize is that people bring their own, even, even if they're, you know, even with the, even with the, at, out at the wall that heals, when people see the care package or the C rations, they go, oh, you know, those, that's what I, you know, that's, I remember that from that, or I remember, you know, this was different for me. And they bring their own experiences and histories to it. Or, you know, with the um, with the prosthetic leg or with anything, they they bring their own memory to it. And that's that's valuable right. and that's yeah. really important. Yeah. Right. I'm tell you one other story as it goes yeah. to the Smithsonian. I can tell you the thousand of them. But when we were Jennifer and I were sitting down and we were wanted to do a mock-up within the gallery. Uh 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 Wheeler, Jack Wheeler, Willie was responsible for that collection because he pulled a lot of leverage to get that collection in there as soon as it was. Normally there's about a three year waiting period to exhibit at the Smithsonian, but Jack had yeah. the juice, Jack Webb, okay, one of the founder members. Okay, so anyway, we had a gallery which was unheard of <laughs> at, the, at the Smithsonian. That's how much space they gave us. But anyway, Jennifer wanted to do a mock-up of the wall. That's okay. So she gave me the dimensions required. She said, I, I need the uh, dimensions of a panel to go to fit in here, whatever, whatever. I said, okay. So I went down to the wall with my ruler, measuring tape. And I came back with some candidates, maybe three, maybe four candidates. So I said, Jennifer, these are panels. Said, so selection. So she looked at them and she said, "Well, I choose this one." I said, sure. She said, "Yes, I choose one." I said, Why are you asking me that? I said, "Jennifer, because that would have been a panel I've been on if I had died." Huh? Okay. She chose. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just like, it's so bananas, especially because the wall is as big as it is, you know, to think yeah. that, that that was the situation. That was the situation. She could ask for the dimensions. I went down there and said, these, these, these are the candidates. Yeah. 